Good evening. It's so nice to be here with you. Uh, like Josh said, we were here last year. It was our privilege to come and serve at the women's conference last year, and then we did it again this Saturday. Um, if you have your Bibles, you can open to Matthew chapter 25. But it's been a blessing to be here um, serving in the Selwer Academy and, and all around in uh, Eldoret. We're excited for the concert tomorrow night uh, to see what the Lord wants to do there. Uh, but I'm just, I'm blessed. Blessed that I get to come and serve alongside brothers and sisters from another continent uh, to see that the body of Christ is not a small thing, but the body of Christ is all around the world. There'll be men and women standing around the throne in heaven from Africa and Asia and Europe and North America, South America, Australia. There'll be people from all different time periods. And that's the, the beauty of the reward of Jesus' suffering. So before we start here in Matthew chapter 25, I'd like to, uh, like to pray and we can begin. Father, thank you so much once again for your word. We wouldn't be here without your word. We wouldn't be here without your son. And we ask that now you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. We need your spirit to take your word and to sow it into our hearts, to apply it to our lives. We ask that you would speak. We ask that all the cares of the day from our jobs and our homes and the things that would burden us, that we would leave them at your feet and be able to receive from you. So bless this time of your word. Strengthen our hearts. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 25, Jesus talking to his disciples. He begins in chapter 24. His disciples ask him some questions about the end times. Ask him questions about the sign of his coming. And Jesus takes all of chapter 24 to answer some of their questions. And he answers questions about his return here on earth. And he tells them things about the great tribulation, about the abomination of desolation. He tells them things about at the end of the age when the sun and the moon will go dark and the sign of his coming will appear in the sky. But then about halfway through the chapter, around verse 32, he switches. And he begins to talk about Something that happens suddenly. Something that happens almost secretly. And if you're not prepared for it, you'll miss it. And he gives examples like Noah. You know the story of Noah from Genesis, how he built the ark. And he was building and building and he was prepared. And then one day God said, Noah, enter into the ark. And God shut the door. And everyone around him was going around life as normal. They thought that it was like any other day. There was weddings and there were parties. There was lunches and, and there was normal things happening. But then it started to rain. And it was unlike anything that had ever happened before. And then it, it, was, it was too late to get onto the ark. And he tells stories about a thief coming in the night. He says, if you're not prepared, it will catch you by surprise, as if a thief came in the night. And he tells stories about a faithful or an evil servant who would be ready for the return of his master or not be ready. And he's switched from talking about that return when he sets up his throne and he judges and he enters into his reign here on earth to a, a different coming. We would call it the rapture. And it's going to come quick. And I want to look at these two parables in chapter 25 that Jesus gives us about his imminent return and the way we as believers should be ready for that. Chapter 25, verse 1 says this, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. 
And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all of those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went out to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterwards, the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, and he said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you do not know the day or the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Jesus here tells this story, and it's a very normal thing in this day, in this age, a wedding. And in this day, a wedding would be arranged and a a date would be set and a a specific set of time would be set from when the engagement started to the wedding day. And the groom would go and he would begin to prepare the house. He would build onto his father's house. And when that was completed, sometimes up to a year, then the bridegroom would come at the around a specific day to gather his bride and they would go and there would be a feast and there would be a celebration. Now, the Jewish day doesn't start at midnight like ours does. It starts at sundown. When you can see three stars in the sky, it becomes the next day. So the bride and and her bridesmaids, they know, okay, he's coming. And they're expecting him. They're all ready. They have their lamps or maybe torches. They're all ready for him to come. But for some reason, he's delayed. He doesn't come at exactly the time they're expecting. And they fall asleep. And it seems that maybe their lamps or their torches are burning while they sleep. And then the shout goes out. He's coming. The bridegroom is coming. And when at first all ten looked prepared and looked ready... There were five who were truly ready and five who were, were not. Five of them knew if he is delayed, I will need more oil for my lamp. I'll need to put more oil in so it will continue to burn. There would be a procession from the bride's house to the groom's house and it would be a torch lit or lantern lit procession. And there was no room in the procession for those who had no lamp or no torch ready to go. So five wake up and they realize, okay, my lamp has been burning and I need to add more oil. I need to add more so that I can go in the procession. And five wake up and realize, oh no, my oil is running low. Maybe it has burnt out. And they ask the others, please, can we have some? But they say, no, there's not enough for both you and me. You need to go get some. And while they're off trying to buy, I'm sure the merchants are asleep and have to be woken and they get their oil and they come back, but it's too late. They've missed it. They've missed the procession. And here's what Jesus wants us to understand. All 10 looked ready. All 10 had their lamps. All 10 knew he was coming. But five left things undone. They weren't prepared for the delay. They weren't prepared for for the bridegroom to delay his coming and still be ready. And the warning is, for us, for the church, we've been waiting for the bridegroom to come for 2,000 years. We've been waiting for Jesus to come for 2,000 years. Through his word, he said, I'm coming back. But sometimes it can seem like, well, it's been so long. He's not going to come today. He's not going to come tomorrow. I'll have time later to get things ready. I'll have time when I'm older. I'll have time when it's more convenient to be ready. But the story is, no, you need to be ready because he might come today or he might come in 50 years. We as believers should live every day as if today is the day that Jesus will return. But we should prepare 
for him to not come until we're old, not come for another 30, 40, or 50 years. We need to plan and prepare and be ready. We should not be the kind of people who sit on our our couch and look out the window and just think, I don't need to work, I don't need to do anything because Jesus is coming. No, we need to be about the Father's business. We need to be ready if he comes today or if he comes further on in life. These five bridesmaids, five virgins who did not have the oil, did not get to enter into the feast. They did not get to go in and and enjoy the feast because they were not ready. We can claim the name of Jesus. I am a Christian. I follow Jesus. But if our hearts are not ready, if our hearts are not turned to him and expecting his return, and he comes, and we have not truly dealt with the things that needed to be dealt with and prepared for his return, we may miss it. There's one thing to claim the name of Jesus, and there's something different to truly surrender your life to Jesus. It's easy to say I'm a Christian, both, I believe, here in Kenya and in the United States where I'm from. Lots of people say I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian, praise the Lord, I'll go to heaven. But we don't see any genuine life, any fruit, any reality. Those are the five who who look prepared. Maybe they even attend church. But there has been no repentance. There's been no genuine transformation by the love of Jesus Christ. There's been no salvation extended because they just looked the part. But they didn't prepare themselves. You cannot be prepared for the return of Jesus Christ if you do not become born again. Jesus said you will not see the kingdom of heaven if you are not first born again. That's what he said to Nicodemus in John chapter three. That is the way you become prepared. You get born again. You repent of your sins. You turn from them. You accept the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and you live Surrendered to him as your king and your Lord. But the challenge for us, I imagine you're here on a Thursday night, that you've done that part. You've made that commitment. You've given your life to Jesus. But are you ready? Are there things left undone? If Jesus stepped into your home, would there be things you didn't want him to see? If he heard the way you spoke to your wife, or to your husband? Would there be things you wouldn't want him to hear? Would there be things on your TV that you would hope he wouldn't see? Are you ready for Jesus to come? Because tonight, what better place to be if he came than sitting in church hearing his word? We need to be ready. Jesus tells another story here. Look at verse 14. The kingdom of heaven as like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more. But... He who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. And his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He who has received two talents came and said, Lord, you have delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. And the Lord said, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man. Reaping where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. 
I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed. You ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus tells a story. There is a a man. He's a wealthy man. He's traveling to a far country. And as he goes, he leaves some of his talent as a measure of, of weight. In this story, it is used as a weight of money. We may not know exactly the sum, but is a large amount, is a large amount of money. He gives it to his servants. And this story, this parable, is not a parable about Uh, talent or ability it's a story about responsibility he gives to each one according to their ability so he knows some of us are more talented than others he knows that some of us will be better with different things you would not want me to come up on stage and try to sing for you I can't sing like Peter or like Josh I can't play an instrument I enjoy worship that is not an ability the Lord has given me But the Lord has given me some abilities. They may be small, but he has given me some abilities. These men, this master gives a weight of money, a talent, based off of their ability. Some of them are more equipped to handle more than others. But what you'll notice is the man who had five and the man who had two both get the same response from the master. He's not more pleased in the man who had more than he was with the man who had less. They are both responsible with the thing that the Lord gives them and use it to further his kingdom, his property, his value, his worth. He gives it to them and we're not told how they invest them, the things that their master gives. But it's a good investment. They double. The man with five now has ten. The man with two now has four. And the day when it seems very suddenly he comes, it says in verse 19, after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with him. So he's been gone a long time. And then one day he's back. And he calls his servants in. He says, okay. Tell me, what have you done with the things I left under your care? What have you done with the things that I gave to you? And the first man says, here is my five, here is five more. Well done, good and faithful servant. The next man, here is the two and here is two more. And he gets the same response, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. See, These men could not have received that response if they just sat and thought, the master won't come, we'll deal with this tomorrow, we'll worry about these things later. No, you notice they both very quickly begin to use the things the Lord gave them. They use them and and grow them. For us, maybe the Lord has given you a musical ability Maybe he's given you a a mind that is very bright. Maybe he has just given you children. Maybe he's given you things that you overlook and think, well, that man has five things. I only have one. That man has two. I only have one. But see, the Lord does not judge on how much you've been given. What he does is he judges over what you do with what you have. The first two were prepared. When the master returned, they had something to show. They had not wasted their time. They had not wasted what was given to them. They used it. 
The third man, he's a fearful man. He's afraid, is what he says. I was afraid. And instead of taking that money and and even just investing it for a small amount of return, loaning it with interest, he digs a hole and he buries it. Which seems to be a common way in this culture, in this day, to keep things safe. He digs a hole and he buries it. And he is content just to give back what was given to him. He wasn't willing to use the things the Lord had given to bless the Lord's kingdom. I will just hide this away and keep it safe. And as you see, he's got a very different opinion of who his master is. His other, his peers, they don't seem to be afraid. They probably take some risks. There's a good return on what they did. But he is afraid. He says, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered. I was afraid. I went and hid it in the ground. Look, here you have what is yours. It seems like this man thought, if I use these talents and these abilities for my master, I won't get to keep the profits that I have earned. Now, we can look at this with logical minds and we can say the, um, the things that he used were not his to begin with. They were the Lord's or his master's when he started. So any investment gained would be his master's. And here's the picture I think Jesus wants us to, to see. Each of you have been given something. Whether you are a parent with children at home, that is a blessing from the Lord. If you're a mother caring for young ones, if you're a father caring for young ones, if you've been given a job, if you've been given abilities and talents in one way or another, you can use them like the world. You can hide them away for selfish reasons and you can say, I want to use this for myself. I want to hide it away and be selfish. Or you can use it for the Lord's kingdom. You can take the things that the Lord gives you and say, I want to train up my child in the way he should go and when he is old, I will not, he will not depart from it. I want to take the small blessings, maybe they're small, Maybe other people have more. Maybe I only have a little. But I want to use them because one day the master is returning. One day, just like the last story, the bridegroom will return. And one day I'll have to give an account. I'll have to say, what did I do with what you have given me? What did I do with the things that you blessed me with? Did I use them for your kingdom? Did I use them to share the gospel? Did I use your word? Did I use the things I have? Because even if you have very little and you use it for God's kingdom, knowing one day he's coming back, one day I'll stand before him and give an account for all that I have, he'll look at you and he'll say, well done. Well done. Good and faithful servant, enter into the joys of your Lord. But if you're the kind of person who hides those things away, you know the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, that he rose again on the third day, that you would have life, that he ascended into heaven so that we would have access there. If you know that but you keep that quiet, you're like the man who digs the hole and hides it away and when you, you get there, when Jesus returns, you will give an account. You'll give an account. You'll have to answer, what did you do with what I gave you? And Jesus here, as he tells the story, and as he tells the 
the parable before with the virgins and their oil, and even the one before that that we didn't talk about, there are consequences. Actions have consequences. The way we view Jesus, the way we respond to his word, the things that we do, there are consequences. If we are not ready, if we are not prepared when Jesus returns, well, there will be consequences. In the story in the end of chapter 24, the servant who was not prepared says that he's going to be cut in two. The wise and the foolish virgins, the ones who are not ready, get left outside the banquet. This man here says that his his talents are taken from him and given to the others. And then it says, verse 30, cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus wants us to know that not only do we need to be ready, but there are consequences for not being ready. There are consequences for those things. We know if we study scripture that his return, his rapture, after that there's a time of horrible tribulation, horrible trials. It does not mean that you cannot get saved, but a person who knows all of God's word but does not get saved There's consequences. There are things that they will endure that Jesus would spare us from. The parable of the the three virgins teach us God may delay longer than expected just like the bridegroom, but we must be prepared for his delay. Inadequate preparations have consequences. We should have our lamps burning today And we should have oil ready for the next 50 years. I think another smaller lesson in there is no one else can prepare you but you. The five who did not bring their oil couldn't count on anyone else to get them what they needed. They needed to have their own oil. You can't count on a a husband or a wife or a mother or a father This is an individual decision. Each person needs to make the choices. The parable of the talents teaches us that we should be busy about the Father's business. There's things to do, there's work to be done. Today we were out working on the land, the GCM land helping to build some of the homes for the the orphans. There's work to be done. If you look around the world, you see brokenness. You see people living in sin, living in depression, anxiety, living in all kinds of brokenness. There's work to be done. There's the good news. There's hope to be extended. They won't know it if you don't tell them your neighbors, your co-workers, your family members who do not know Jesus. Maybe, maybe they claim to be a Christian. But you know that there's no real fruit. There's no real life. There's work to be done. There's physical work. There's spiritual work. There are things to do. You can waste the things that you have on selfish desires. You can hide those away. But there's work to be done. Are you willing to do the work? I would love to be found by Jesus doing his work. I would love to be found about his business. I would not like to be found doing something opposite, doing something sinful. I don't want to be spending the day doing something that goes against the will of Jesus and have him return. And the first thing I have to do is explain to him why I was somewhere else. I would love to be at a church service, at a prayer meeting, at a worship 
night. Serving widows or orphans. Because Jesus is coming. If you read 20, chapter 24, you see all the things that are happening in the world. And you recognize he has to come soon. It could be tonight. It could be tomorrow morning. It could be tomorrow night. What are the things left undone? What are the things in your life that need to be addressed? What are the things that need to be let go of? Is there bitterness? Is there hatred? Is there anger? Because Jesus is big enough to deal with those things. Yes, maybe there's been abuse. Maybe there's been difficult things that you've held on to, that you've harbored in your heart. But Jesus can, can take that and can use that for his glory. I can think in my life the most difficult things that happened, if you heard my testimony last year, was being in that car accident and watching a friend die and realizing I was the cause of that. Realizing that I had been careless with another person's life. But I'll tell you, the greatest thing that Jesus ever did, the most faithful thing that he has ever done is allowed me to go through that difficulty. Because if not, I would not know his love. I would not know his care. I would not know his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness. I would have been one of those five who were not ready. Maybe I would have spent my life in a pew at church. Maybe I would have claimed to know him. But the Lord allowed me to be broken so that he could heal me, that he could change me. I would not have been ready, but now I'm ready. Are you ready? Are there things in your life that, that he's been saying, he's been knocking on your heart? I need you to surrender this. I need you to surrender the alcohol. I need you to surrender the immorality. I need you to surrender because I'm coming, I'm coming. I've given you talents and abilities. I want you to use them for me. I don't want you to become a musician and make millions of, of shillings. I want you to, to use your voice to praise me. I want you to use your gift of playing instruments to praise me. I want you to use your skills as a a manual laborer to build homes, to volunteer. I watch around this church, and so many of you do this as I look. So many of you are here, cleaning the floors, setting up chairs, serving in so many ways. Maybe you don't have the most things, but when Jesus comes back and you've spent time setting up chairs, what he's gonna say is, well done, good and faithful servant, well done. My Savior is coming back. He's not wasting time, he's waiting. He knows when he will arrive, and he's waiting to see whether we will be ready. There's three lessons I take from this parable of the, the talents. God expects you to be a good steward with the things he has given you. Whatever those talents, those ability, those things are he's gifted you. Some of you may have many talents. Some of you may have few. That's not what he's looking at. He doesn't favor the man with more talents over the man with less talents. He favors the man who is responsible with what he has who uses those things for his kingdom and for his glory. And we will be rewarded based off of our faithfulness. Look what he says in verse 29. For everyone who has, more will be given. 
and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. The man who was responsible, who was faithful, has even more given to him. When we enter into heaven and we were faithful with little, we'll be given more to be faithful with. Earthly idea is the more that we, we get, the more we can relax. If I'm faithful, then I'll get to, in heaven, maybe sit back and kick my feet up and relax. No, throughout Scripture, what we see is the reward for faithfulness is more responsibility. You can serve me better now. Here are more ways you can serve me. You've grown, serve me now. You've grown again, continue to serve me. You've grown some more, keep serving we're going to be rewarded in heaven. And there is judgment for those who do not use the gifts and the abilities that God has given. I don't want to stand before the Lord and know that I could have done more. Know that I wasted time. How precious time is. It goes so quickly. We've been here in Eldoret since last Friday. Almost a week has gone by. Time, you can't slow it, you can't speed it up, but it's gone when it's gone. You have invested time into something good tonight. Not me, the word of God, the worship of God. Are we faithful with our time? Are we faithful with the things he's given us? We don't know whether we'll live to be 90 years old, or 30 years old, or 20 years old. We've been given time. Are we faithful with it? There is judgment for those who do not use the things he's given us. Every moment is something that could be used for his glory. One day, Jesus will come back. Maybe you'll be at work. Maybe you'll be at church. Maybe you'll be doing whatever it is you do with your leisure time, your free time. Will you be found ready? Or will you be found unready? Will you have your lamps burning and your oil there? Or will your torch have burned out? Will that zeal and that fire have gone? Will you have used the things he gave you for his kingdom or will you have wasted them on selfish pursuits? The person who is ready is the person who is about the master's business, prepared for his return at a moment's notice, working to grow his kingdom. The person who is ready does not make a last minute adjustment It's not the person who hears Jesus is coming tomorrow and begins to change things today. No, the person who is ready lives every day as if today is the day. Do you believe Jesus could come back tonight before you get to your homes? Because that should affect the way that you live. Being ready demands a continuous lifestyle not a last minute adjustment. Each disciple, each person, each follower of Jesus Christ should live in a way that they would hear well done, good and faithful servant. I think it would be good to examine our lives. I need to do it very often. Am I ready? Do I believe? It's so easy to think I have tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it tomorrow. We are not promised tomorrow. We're promised this moment, this breath. I wanna use my life to serve the Lord. I wanna pour out all the strength and all of the energy and all of the love and all of the things that I have for God's kingdom, for his glory, for his honor, And I know if I'm doing that, 
Whether Jesus comes back in the middle of the night or early in the morning or at noon, I won't be ashamed. I won't be unprepared. I'll be ready. Jesus is coming back. And he's coming quickly. 2,000 years may have gone past, but do not think because so much time is gone, he will delay. Live today like you may meet Jesus tonight. And when you wake up tomorrow, live tomorrow like Jesus may come tomorrow. And every day, expect that reunion. Expect him to come. And when he comes, all will be in place. That's my goal. That's my aim. I don't do it perfectly. But I want to be the steward who is faithful, even if it's in a little. I want to be faithful in what I have. I want my life to mean something in the kingdom of heaven. Amen? Let's pray, and then we will continue. Father, I know your son is coming. I know that it could be tonight. And we long to be in your presence. We long to be with you. I want to be ready. I want my friends to be ready. I want my new friends from Eldoret to be ready. I want to stand around your throne. And I want to worship you with everyone that, that's in this room, with my family at home, with the church all around the world. Lord, help us to be ready. Help us to expect your return, your imminent return. Show us how to be faithful. Show us how to be prepared. Show us what abilities you've given us to use for you. We don't want to be caught sleeping and unprepared. We give you our hearts. We give you our lives. We pray Jesus in your name. Amen.